It's really good to be back. Uh, really, um, I, I love this series. I love doing this series, and I always make time for it. It's really good to have uh, someone like Emma uh, Sinclair uh, on the stage with me as well. I'm going to speak very quickly, because I've got lots of questions I want to ask Emma, but I know you guys have lots of questions as well, and this is about you uh, and about Emma. So, so, so let me go. Um, entrepreneur, techie, youngest to IPO is what you say on your, on your Twitter page. M&A banker traded the market at university, you flip burgers, you clean McDonald's toilets, you read the FT on your way to school. You know, the entrepreneur and techie aside, what part of all of that that I've just mentioned do you think is the most instrumental, the most important to where you've got right now? Um, for me, it was undoubtedly um, the impact of my father um, and probably my whole family. Um, my dad drove me to school every morning and he used to have the newspapers delivered and I used to read him bits and pieces from the FT, including some share prices. He didn't have a great deal of cash, but he had a couple of hundred pounds worth of stock in some of the utilities that were privatized in the 80s. So, you know, one of my earliest memories is the FT being this absolutely huge newspaper where I try and open the, the penultimate page, which is where the stocks were, and it would flop in my face, and I wouldn't be able to hold it up. And, and that's just what we did every day. And yeah. then it went from there, just reading the share prices, to, seeing, you know, to the market cap, to price earnings ratio, to the back page Lex column. So, so, so was, was, was it about you? Game. Was it about you wanting to make money, lots of money, oh, God, no. or was it about you wanting to set up a company, have an exciting life, and do good? It was neither of those, even though they sound much better than my actual answer. <laughs> I mean, at the actual at the time, we did like favorite colored, you know, Carl you saw and Times Table. But I think it might have been just one of the other ways. My dad just basically kept me in check in the back seat of the car. Otherwise, I probably would have just been asking a lot of questions or something. So it was just like this thing that we did. And then it wasn't really until I got to university and I started playing around with the stock markets that I even had any, you know, I even, even vaguely applied it. And, and when people read my bio, um, I definitely, you know, sound more interesting on paper than I am in real life, I'm sure. And one of the things I think about is, you know, I can't believe I had the audacity to think I could IPO a company at 29. Like, mm, mm. why did I think I could do that? But I, I think because the stock market has just been something that I, fiddled around with and talked about from the age of four. Your business, I'm going to sort of jump, jump around a little bit, but you're, you're the co-founder of Enterprise Alumni, Enterprise Jungle. Yeah. Um, and this is how I heard it described, an enterprise software firm that delivers a comprehensive suite of uh, SAP cloud extensions that provide businesses with previously unavailable insights. I didn't get anything from that. Yeah, no. So, so tell, tell, tell these guys what your company yeah, you, does. You, um, you went to kind of the holding company website, and <laughs> okay. that's uh, good feedback. Uh, no, noticed. no, I went to a, a newspaper interview, actually. Oh, it's probably from ages ago. Well, I think one of the things we all know is that when you start something, it never necessarily ends up with what you started. So when we started off, we started building sort of very rapid prototype, cool apps, and I say apps, but for enterprises, they're quite heavy duty apps for the enterprise. And really in your early days, you're trying things out. You're trying to find what works and what resonates with customers. And um, we are 100% focused on enterprise alumni, which is the software that powers corporate alumni mm -hmm. networks. Mm -hmm. And I think it probably resonates with people here because no doubt there's lots of people that are alumni of CAS um, who have come because a friend has invited them. And we all know the power of networks and the power of knowing people. So actually, um, you know, we created a lot of products and that was the one that um, had a real hockey stick resonated with all of the customers we took it to. So um, as of about a year and a half ago, we we're 100% focused on that. And we're the only enterprise grade alumni management platform on the market. At the moment. You know, I find it very interesting because I, I started my journalist career at a company called Bloomberg. And we I all know Bloomberg, it. of course. Now, that, at that time, 25 odd years ago, if you left that company, which I did, you were never, ever going back to that company. That was yeah. one of Mike Bloomberg's big things. Yeah, you were dead. You were dead. Yeah. Uh, it didn't do him much harm, right? Well, I mean, you know, there, things change as we know. And in this day and age, you spend all this time recruiting people and training them and giving them all these wonderful skills. And I think it's sort of occurred to corporates that, first of all, why would you suddenly say thanks, bye, um, in, in your sort of, um, in, in the ilk that you describe. And also, you know, the way people work is changing. I mean, for you and I, we probably had, you know, our parents probably had 
one job in their lifetime. You and I probably, I'm probably a slight anomaly, but you know, you and I probably have six or seven jobs in our mm. lifetime, mm. and probably the next generation will have you know six or seven jobs all at the same time. So finding labour, um, you know, talent is a perpetual source of challenge. And there's all these wonderful websites and social networks, and that's fantastic. But of course, um, none of that data is actually validated. None of it. You can put anything you want on LinkedIn. I mean, you can just put you know. I could, sit, I could put my, the bio that you read on, on LinkedIn and you even believed it. Yeah, you, know, you can write anything you want. <laughs> I didn't like it. But, yeah. <laughs> um, the, uh, you, I mean, you talked about your, your dad and reading the FT and reading the, 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 the pages of the paper and uh, you were trading stocks and shares at, 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 when you were at university. Did you need to go to university? I mean, you studied languages at university. Um, yes, I was was it, you know, how, how important was that piece of, 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 of the, the, the process for you? I mean, hindsight is an amazing thing. So now I can you know, think about the trajectory and the things I've done and I could ask questions. But for me, university did a few things. It was the first time I'd really gone away from home and led a, rel a relatively independent life. I did languages, so I, I worked overseas. And most people that studied languages did a, uh, went into a school and taught English. Um, probably early signs of who I was. I refused to do that and said I was going to find a job. I will always remember uh, the the now head of the French department at the university I went to, I'm always so tempted to write an angry letter to, saying to me, you know, I don't know what makes you think you can get a job in Paris. But I remember thinking to myself, why would I go and teach in some tiny town where there's nothing when I can you know, see the city and earn money? Um, it was great training. Um, it was very important to meet people. It was very important to lead a slightly independent life. I can honestly say I was not the world's best mm, student. Mm, um, mm. I never have been, but I've been one of those annoying people that, you know, read seven books the night before and gets away with it. Um, but, you know, it was more a life experience. And I think, you know, um, there are different things that life teaches you. And, and four years of being away from home, of which two were overseas, um, you know, gave me a chance to grow up. Yeah, um, yeah. But I don't think that there's any right course of action. Okay. So all part of the process. Um, you, you, you went to Rothschilds for a while on the M&A side. Uh, you then set up this, this parking uh, uh, business yep. company, which I'd like, like you to talk a little bit about. But the reason I bring that up is two things, actually. First, you know, it seemed to me when I was reading about you setting up this and knocking on doors and finding out what everyone's doing, emotional intelligence, communication, being quite extroverted, being prepared, being really willing and able to talk to people is a really, really important piece of this. You know what I'm going to say. If you yeah. haven't got that, yeah. can you do what you did? Um, well, I. I didn't know you were going to say that, and you don't know that I'm going to say the following. I was mortally shy as a child. I pretty much never said a word out loud until I was 29, unless I had to. Um, and, but you would never have known that, and you would never know that now. And now, if I speak, you, know, you, you can't shut me up, mm. so no one would mm. ever suspect mm. that. So what happened? When did that turn? Um, I read an article by Beyonce. Uh, sorry, no. I read an interview with Beyonce whilst at the hairdressers in Vanity Fair. I'm not much of a reader of magazines because they just used to depress me about what I couldn't afford to buy or wouldn't look that good in. Um, but I was reading this article and um, in it Beyonce was saying that she used to have to have this alter ego called Sasha Fierce because she was so nervous when she went on stage that she wouldn't be able to breathe. And I remember thinking to myself, oh, you know, if, if Beyonce's nervous then, you know, all of us can get nervous. And about a couple of weeks later, I'd IPO'd earlier that year. I was walking down to the PLC Awards. I was 29, I was going in on my own. I walked down the stairs, and there were two men walking in there with me, so I just said hello on the basis I'd have someone to walk in with, and they asked me how organizing the event went, and I thought, how did they even get to that? I mean, was up for an award. Um, and I walked in, and it was just too terrifying, and I was like, I can't do this, and there's a huge room of people, very nervous. Walked back out, and I called my other half, and he was just like, Sasha Fierce. And from then on, for a little while, mm. when I was a bit scared of something, I would just be like, right, Sasha Fierce. Okay, okay. Um, you, Keep okay, learning. parking. Yes. I mean, <laughs> you know, people wonder why parking. And it, I found it very interesting, actually, something you've said, that you said, I warm to opportunities rather than a sector. <laughs> and and I've got to say, that, that stuck out for me, because I'm not an entrepreneur, but, but a lot of the entrepreneurs I've spoken to, including on this stage, need to feel really, really passionate about the business they're getting into. You clearly didn't feel that passionate about parking, but you made it work. But How does that happen? I don't mean to be tricky with every question, but I, I don't a, mean to play devil's advocate. Uh, and I, but I took the first <laughs> half of that, and I wouldn't necessarily agree with, with the comment about passion. Um, in not being, in some ways, 
absolutely fussy about, sect about the sector, it doesn't mean that you're not then passionate about opportunities. So for example, I'm now in enterprise software. Lots of people love consumer tech. Facebook, social networks, apps on your phone, we can all relate to them, we all use them, they sound fun, you get like a cool t-shirt when you go to their stand at a conference. Enterprise software, very large customers, not that sexy, doesn't sound that cool, but wildly lucrative. I am passionate about wildly lucrative, for mm, example. Mm, mm, um, mm. Parking, you know, there was a very clear opportunity to do things differently. I mean, I've had two parking companies and um, in building a business that did things differently, um, you know, I was, I was hugely passionate about what we were doing and I'm always hugely passionate about delivering what I say I'm going to deliver. So I don't think you have to wake up and be like, you know, fuck, I love that sector. Excuse my language, um, mm, mm, but um, mm, mm, mm. you know. But equally, you can find something, and when you find that thing that you know you can do better, I mean, that's what I get excited about. Yeah, and 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 you did well in parking, right? Yeah, I did well. Right. You, you yeah, you did well. Yeah. I mean, how well did you do in parking? I did okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I can see this is going to be a struggle. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, but you got out of those businesses, yeah. and then and then how did you make that shift to to to? Uh, um, well, I think that um, each business I've had has brought me different experiences and has also led to different understandings of scale. Enterprise Jungle, Enterprise Alumni, which is our hero product, um, is really the, the sort of biggest business I've had at scale. Our customers are HSBC and SAP and Lufthansa, mm -hmm. huge globally dispersed workforces, fairly sizable contracts and a, and a business that really touches people everywhere. And my other businesses have been more domestic. So there have been different things that I've learned along the way. And um, in terms of how enterprise, you know, how I came to enterprise software, um, my business partner, unusually, is my brother, um, who uh, took a very different route to me, didn't go to university, was always building things that we never understood on a computer, which at the time we were absolutely convinced he was going to, you know, hack something and we'd have to get him out of jail. This was before I had any understanding of technology and he was a family help desk when the printer wasn't working. Um, he's obviously come a long way since and, and we were talking um, at the back end of when I had target parking about a number of things he'd identified and, and he was like, well, we're going to do this together. And I remember saying, you know, I, at this time I was writing twice a week for the Telegraph for the Wonder Woman column, I was running target parking. I'd also set up a kind of small side business with a few friends, a, a health and wellbeing members club. And I was like, listen, I, I'm right behind you. Whatever it is you need from me, I'm totally going to help, but I have enough to do. But actually what ended up happening is I sold Target Parking because it became very apparent that the opportunity um, mm -hmm. with Enterprise Alumni was more compelling and suited me more, and I haven't looked back since. Um, you talk about working with your brother, who, who's your, your co-founder, as you say. You've, you've worked with your dad before you brought him as a chairman. In which yeah. company was it? In my first company, the IPA. In your first company. I mean, how does that work? I mean, the people here who would shudder to think of uh, you know, working with, with, with their family much rather bring in a big name from the outside or someone well, no worries. I mean, just, just give us your thoughts on yeah. that. Why the, why, why the family? Do you have to really get on with them? Well, to start with, the final point last, I mean, big names, I learned, I've learned my lessons in life. Big names don't necessarily mean anything. Um, you know, just because someone has a massive name and their appointment to your board gets you in the FT, it just simply doesn't mean that they'll contribute well to your business or, in fact, be the right person for your business. Um, as to the family point, I know I'm in camera, on camera, so I think I'll say the following. You know, we all have, you know, for those of us that have siblings, we all ruck a little bit. Mm. I mean, it's just, mm. you know. But I have never had a business partner that is as smarter than me and who has been, who's taken my breath away, and I hadn't really anticipated that was what was going to happen. Don't get me wrong, occasionally weird things happen where we'll be on an office conference call and I'll be like, finishing up and have you called your grandma, it's her birthday and everyone will be like, that's a bit weird. <laughs> um, you know, yeah. so there are, there are a, a couple of things that happen every now and then when the family bit sort of falls in. But equally, I mean, if you think about it, we've got a bond and a tie that's pretty unbreakable. And if one of us says we're going to do something or is responsible for something, even those decisions that you, can't, you couldn't imagine that a co-founder could make on their own, whether it's decisions about fundraising or decisions about, um, you know, that have massive impact on our p and we mm, trust mm, each mm, other mm. and that is um, special. What what, I mean, what, what do you need in a, in a, in a partner? Mm. What, what's really important? I mean, you, you, I believe you and your dad, did you ever have to tell your dad that he was doing something really wrong? Or, or? No, that was a tricky one and it was a very interesting lesson because, uh, you know, you always have to go with your gut, but I respect and love my father, so I definitely trod more carefully there. But equally, I was the only MD that brought their chairman, you know, chopped apple and biscuits at 11 a.m. So they were, you know, it was a two-way street. Um, but in terms of a co-founder or what someone is looking for, I mean, for me, as you know, you may sense, I'm very ambitious. 
my co-founder is very ambitious. We both think very big, and that's definitely taken time. I mean, I didn't have the capacity to think the way that I do now because I simply didn't have the experience or the confidence. And everything you do before, including your failures and all your awful experiences, lend themselves to you know the, the hopefully the thing you're going to do that's um, mm -hmm. you know that that final that one big thing that you apply everything you've learned before to. So in terms of a co-founder, I mean you know you for me I need somebody that um, is good at things that I'm not. My brother is supremely um, spectacular at technology, enterprise software, and spent his life in that in that business. Um, we complement each other in terms of how we deal with people. Um, you know, I tend to initially lead on fundraising, mm, um, mm, a lot mm. of corporate decisions, um, but we just complement each other well. And I think we, we've been very lucky because it's allowed us to grow very quickly. And the other thing is him being based in Los Angeles means from day one, there's always been a principal available for any single call with any member of the team awake. And yeah, that's allowed yeah. us to work at sort of top speed to grow. You know, you, you talk about fundraising and that's your thing. Um, you begin to get a sense of how important the money is to doing what you do and building that entrepreneurial spirit and making something of it. You know, I was, I was doing something in, in, in South Africa last week with a, with a whole bunch of entrepreneurs and one of the things that stuck with me was one of the guys who runs a very, very successful company said, you know what, the money was n by no means the most important thing, it was mentoring. It was the people I work with. Um, are you going to shoot that down? <laughs> Um, I don't mean to be tricky about everything. No, so, please. Um, you know, for me, I can only speak subjectively. Enterprise businesses are expensive to run. You know, when your customers are $50 billion businesses, you know, you need to have a decent sized team. You need very qualified people. We can't just have a couple of people that have just come out of college that are, are, are sort of very smart and full of ambition but haven't had experience. So it's expensive to run an enterprise business and, um, and that takes money and you simply can't, you know, any business, any growing business I'd say is underfunded but you need to have some sort of capital base that allows you to deliver otherwise you fall immediately and you won't win customers. So money is very important um, and um, frankly bills have to be paid. So, um, but I think all of, all of the things you mentioned collectively contribute. Um, and you use different things at different times, just like when you're studying or when you're whatever everybody is doing here, uh, no doubt you and your career, there are, you, know, you pull the tricks that you have out the bag at different times because you need them the most. When you're fundraising, you, know, you need to get out there, you need yeah, to be very clear yeah, about yeah. why you need your money. At other times, you, know, you want to build your network, you want to uh, sort of engage customers. So uh, you know, you're almost a kind of jack of all trades, whatever size your business is. Um, and I think that, that, you know, that continues long after you've started it and your team grows. How, how has the fundraising been? Um, you know, going into meetings uh, as a female entrepreneur, we've had several here on this stage, uh, you know, going into meetings with the likes of Eileen Burbage and people like that. Explain that, that process to us, how, how that was for you, whether people like Eileen really helped this process. Well, um, you know, different businesses require different sorts of funding. So I've had a PLC, which required one type of investor. I've had a private company, and now, um, you know, we've got a we've got a, a different set and, and type of investors in our software company. Um, you know, and it depends who you take money from. Um, the VC process is very different to private investors. It's very different to family offices. Um, it's very different between Europe and and, and Silicon Valley, for mm -hmm. example. Um, I don't think that um, venture capital. Um, investment is a measure of success. You know, I read every day, so-and-so got 20 million, 50 million investment. Mm -hmm. It's certainly extremely important and, and, a, and a great validation about your business model. And a massive confidence builder, I would massive imagine, right? Massive confidence builder. So many great things about it, but I don't think it's a mark of success because really you've got to do good things with that money. Um, you know, I don't think I know any entrepreneur that enjoys fundraising. It is the bane of every entrepreneur's life, but it's necessarily evil in some ways. I think the really important thing is almost to treat it like marriage. Mm. You know, when you go into business with investors, they're going to be in it for a long time with you, and there will be plenty of highs and high fives that go with that. But there will be a lot of lows and a lot of very tricky days where you know you need people to stick with you. Yeah. And I think choosing investors is something. You know, w w when we did our last round of investment and we went to VC firms, number one, I did enormous amounts of due diligence on every single partner of every VC firm because I wanted to know what they'd offer me. I wanted to know the experience other entrepreneurs had because it's not a one-way thing. I'm hugely grateful for people that want to invest in us, but also we're offering them an opportunity and I think mm -hmm. age has given me that confidence. You know, the other thing is, is that um, you, know, you don't, people pressure you about 
exits, for example, if they're in a you know a VC firm, there's a sort of definitive you know definite timeline. Whereas private investors have a very different timeline. So I think you also have to choose the kind of money that suits the kind of business you have. It's hard to say that because when you're raising money, any money that suits you is good money, and mm. you really mm. want to get mm. it closed. But the older I get, the more I recognise that it's not just any money. You've got to choose the right money. You know, I, you know, I, I don't know uh, how many times ever that you've been kicked back by VCs and 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 people uh, who you've gone to money for. But you know, we've had people up here have been kicked, kicked back a lot. I've spoken to people who've been kicked Everyone back. Everyone has. And anyone yeah, says but I've been, been spoken to people who've been kicked back so much that they've actually lost it and done, and done something else. If you hadn't had, if you hadn't had the success that you had with the VCs, and of course you did your due diligence, you did your hard work, but if you hadn't had that, would you still be doing what you did? I didn't take our last VC round. I chose not to. Um, and for a variety of reasons. Um, because I didn't think it was the right thing at the right time. Um, we inevitably be, will probably do a round next year, a, a very sizable round, and, and probably driven out of the US and not out of the UK. Um, and so I think that, um, you know, I think one of the most important things is, is confidence to say, you know, yes sometimes, but confidence to say no. I really believe that business and life is a lot about gut instinct, and if something doesn't feel quite right, don't do it. But you're, you're saying that now at this stage mm. right at the beginning of this process w would you did you have that mentality i mean would you would you you didn't have the luxury to say that back then um at the beginning we self-funded and then we had investment from a few people that had backed us before and that was a real gift and a luxury it, it wasn't enough it was never enough but we didn't know it wouldn't be enough at the time um, but we have been really fortunate, our like genuinely, our investor base are the most wonderful people, not just as financial support, but I've got shareholders that I can go to when I'm, you know, I, I have emotional challenges with the business. Sometimes things happen and I am, you know, a little bit overwhelmed by the size of decision and I'm not 100% sure and you just want to go to someone that doesn't have a vested interest other than for you to make the right decision. So I've been very, very fortunate with my shareholders, but that's not to say that I have been in every other business. You know, I've had bad experiences mm -hmm. with shareholders and that's just taught me to listen to my gut instinct. Yeah, you yeah. know, big names, um, you know, all that sort of thing. You know, I totally understand why that appeals to some people, but getting the right people that feel right for you is the right thing to do, even if it feels like a harder decision and you have to hold out for longer. Okay. Um, is your company making a profit now? Um, we do not declare profits at this point, but purposely, you know, we're growing and we're spending a lot of money engineering and, um, and building. So you can't give us a sense of the revenues or anything like that? No. Nah. No? Nah? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I guess the reason I asked is because I, I, I saw an interview with you uh, when I was just uh, prepping for this evening mm. and you said, look, look, you know, you know, we, we, you, know I, you do your UNICEF stuff, you do the innovation labs in Africa, you do a lot of that stuff, but, but at the bottom line is you are a hard-ass capitalist. You want to make money. Um, you know, I ask this because with the UNICEF piece in mind, uh, I, I speak to a lot of people who, for whom purpose uh, and social good is, is, a, is a real driver. Now, they may be way, way further down on the career path, but what, what's more important to you? Um, there's no either or. Um, my dad, you know, my, I mentioned my dad a lot, but my dad has been really impactful. When I was um, a, deciding on internships during university, I was very fortunate to get some when I started uni. I remember I had an offer to go to Central America and work for this amazing orphanage charity that had really captivated my attention. Or I had the opportunity to work in a bunch of city firms who'd offered me internships in my first year of university, which was super exciting. My dad said to me, the person that can write the check is as important as the person who can spend the check. So right now, unless I am financially secure and unless I build my business and unless I give my shareholders back what I'd like to give them, you know, I, I won't have been a success and I won't have done my job. So right now, I'm doing my job, but I get to use my platform, I get to use a lot of the opportunities I have to do other things that have a different kind of purpose to them. You, know, you can't be all things to all people at, at all times, and um, you know, I can't do everything, but having a business of scale and people being kind enough to be interested in what I'm doing means I can give things like my innovation labs with UNICEF an amazing platform, and people have, you know, we, I just closed a crowdfunding, the first ever for UNICEF, and, and we raised, you know, 60,000 pounds, and that was, you know, that was just from, reaching out to people and mm, that, you know, mm, and mm. so I, I think that, um, you know, at the moment I get to combine the two. I can't wait for the day where I have, you know, a lot more time. Where and I do you do that, that because, you know, I'm sorry to sound so, so crass, but do you do that because it makes you feel good? 
as a, it as a because business. Because I learn well. and because it's the most amazing opportunity. I mean, I didn't know what the UNICEF relationship was going to be when I started. Years ago, they asked me to front this program. Um, they'd been given £10 million to teach entrepreneurship skills in hard to reach places. And I remember thinking at the time when I was on my way to Zambia, what some white chick who IPO'd going to have, you know, be a, why am I going to be of any interest to anybody? I mean, I just feel like this is really not the best idea. And then I realised when I got out there that, you know, entrepreneurship is a universal language. The first guy I met was a guy called Kenneth. You know, he started out by, you know, in, um, in Zambia and in a lot of parts of Africa, people make a living by burning trees and, and selling it by the side of the road for next to no money. He had a microloan, he planted some vegetables, and he got a bigger vegetable garden and bigger and bigger. And, you know, I was asking him, he was working upwards of 18 hours a day, he had to carry water for miles away. I'm like, well, you know, why are you working so hard now? You've got enough to feed your children. And he said, I want to give my children um, opportunities I didn't have. And if you ask my dad why he worked so hard, because he did, he worked in a menswear shop and then he did night school and then eventually went into real estate. You know, he would say he wanted to give his children the opportunities in life he never had. He never mm -hmm. went to university. Mm -hmm. He had to do night school in order to get a professional job. So, um, you know, I just get to have the most amazing interactions and I meet amazing people. And I never really backpacked as a teenager and I never had the opportunity to see the world. And like, what an amazing thing to be able to go to a refugee camp and say, you know, what well, I'm going to mm -hmm. find the mm -hmm. money to build you an innovation app so that you can learn to code. I mean, it's a... You know, it's, it's a gift to me as well, so yeah, I'm really no, grateful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you, you've sung the praises of the UK digital economy. You called it best in class. Um, <laughs> you, you know, I, I want to explore that a little bit. Does the UK government do enough for companies like yours, for people who want to do what you did, do you think? Um, I think the job of a government is purely to provide a robust infrastructure. Um, and um, to that end, I think we're very, very lucky here. I think we forget how much we have access to. I mean, even just something like this evening. Um, you know, I go to a million countries where they have incubators, where there's just like absolutely no resource. The you know, in fact, the refugee camps, the innovation labs, no one even has the internet. Um, so I think that, um, you know, I think that the government's job is to make sure that we stay competitive. I think there's a lot to be done in terms of you know, and are they doing a good job of that? I think they're doing, you know, I think everyone's doing their best, but there's room for a lot more improvement. Right. I do sincerely feel that being in government in this day and age is a very, very difficult job. I think it's very hard to be an honest leader. You have people, you know, jumping down your throat if you say anything they don't like. And I think to myself very often, I meet amazing people who I think would make great leaders and great politicians, and, and people are not yeah, willing yeah. to do that job. So I think it's very hard. Definitely I mean, more to be done, though. Yeah, I mean, this is a whole whole other conversation. We've spent yeah. hours on this. But, um, you know, we've got to talk about Brexit. Uh, you know, there are people here who are going to be setting up, wanting to set up businesses yeah. now mm. um, and when they leave here. Um, I mean, what, what do you, how, how do you characterize the environment now? Um, I mean, you talk about the difficulty of being a politician now. I mean, there may be half the people in this room think we have a, an extremely inept government that makes really bad decisions. Do they want to do business in a country like that? I think that everybody needs to have a little breather and take a little step back. You know, this is the United Kingdom. We've been an economic powerhouse for quite some time. We have amazing talent. We have amazing entrepreneurship community and entrepreneurs are naturally designed to find their ways around problems. I am less um, terrified than your average person about what the implications of Brexit will be. I do think it would be really helpful to have a task force of incredible business people to really just go out there and hammer a deal. But um, I, you know, my general view is that we will be, we will be okay. And I know that no one likes uncertainty. It's a, a horrible environment for people to be in, and people get terribly scared. And I know that there are so many different messages out there, and it's really hard to make sense of, of what is right and what is wrong. But ultimately, we have been an economic powerhouse for quite some time, and I am quite relaxed that we will be quite fine going forward. Okay. Mm. Um, Famous last words. Yeah. 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 Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of people that want, want to ask you about that. Kids, but, so, like, you know, make uh, your own luck. <laughs> are you are you a disruptor? Do you think? Um, you know, we had this, this this. I mean, we we you know, everyone talks about the, being disrupted and mm. disruptors and disruptees and you know if you're an incumbent who is disrupted, mm. you ain't ever coming back. Yeah, was one yeah. phrase that stuck with me. Well, the, the from life last cycle week. of businesses these days is is much shorter, and so I think that in general, you know, business is disrupt, you know, is disrupted, and technology is disruptive for the better. Um, you know, and in many ways, I think you know, companies 
sort of giving birth to and companies dying faster just means that you know it's effectively survival of the fittest a little bit. You know, having said that, my Vodafone contract for the last few years has been appalling, and they still haven't collapsed yet. Um, <laughs> but um, you know, I think that um, it's very important to always look at doing things differently, and I um, sincerely think there are always opportunities everywhere. And you know, whatever the word is, disrupt. It's very hard to disrupt very large enterprises. They make it very, very, very hard for you to do so. Mm -hmm. And also, it's mm -hmm. as, as anyone here as an entrepreneur will know, however big your business is, doing business with very large enterprises, getting them through procurement, all these things are hugely challenging. So to really knock very large incumbents off their perch is very tricky but certainly you know you always need push and pull factors whether it's government large enterprise NGOs you need people asking questions and prodding mm. so that people do not rest too much on their laurels mm. um, and certainly you know in terms of our business you know we're, we're considered pretty disruptive in, in, in HR software and you know alumni the largest talent pool on the planet and, and had not really been harnessed in the technolo technological way before it was just done on a spreadsheet which is obviously not the most efficient way to do business. So, um, yes, we're a bit disruptive, and my co-founder and I are arguably a little bit disruptive in general anyway. But what, I do my what, best. What, you know, I'm really wary of the time I'm going to come to you, you guys in a minute, but what worries you the most? I mean, you seem quite so sanguine about a lot of things. Yeah. I mean, what really, really worries you right now about um, your business? About my business? Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, yeah, about your business. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a very broad <laughs> question. And the context to... that your business sits in. Clearly, it's not Brexit. Well, I mean, you know, there will always be political situations thrown in there. In terms of the business, um, I think that we just all, any good entrepreneur that's building a business at scale has to spend, you know, almost every waking moment being a little bit um, neurotic that someone is going to try and take a perch. You know, we are the only enterprise grade um, platform on the market. Um, and you know this is a the last pillar of HR to be technologized. No one had done it before, so I have every confidence that there are huge companies looking and wondering how they can get in there. But you say um, you don't worry about competitors. Well, it's not that I don't worry about them because you know competition is not a terrible thing. But certainly, you know, first mover advantage has been very helpful, and making sure that we stay you know number one um, ahead of all of uh, people that are attempting to enter the market is always top of the list. And that means never resting on your laurels about new business leads, however mm, many pieces mm. of business you have, about staying in touch with your customers, about customers being happy. So I think really just kind of customer success um, is just sort of always on my mind because the day you become, you know, the, day you, the day you become slack is, mm. is a dangerous day for a business. Um, in general, I'd say though that I, you know, I look around at the world and I read, um, I read voraciously. Um, and I know that statistically, this is kind of one of the safest, calmest um, times that we've ever lived in. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you know, in terms of personal safety, in terms of economic safety. But I'm really sad about so many things I see when I look around the world. I mean, I read today that the UN Human Rights Council have just voted Qatar, uh, the Congo, and uh, you know, and Pakistan onto the council with Saudi Arabia. And I just look at that and I think, what? How can anyone have confidence in the UN with decisions like that? So there's a lot of things I look at that really mm -hmm. upset me. But you know, what can you, you have to do your bit? Okay. Um, look, fi final question. When I ask you what worries you, you 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 talk about healthcare, sustainability, climate, the state of the world. Um, if your shareholders now, or were you to float your institutional clients, shareholders were to say to you, you know, Emma. Um, we don't like what you're doing. Would you be prepared ever to say to them, if you don't like what I'm doing, get out of my stock, go put your money somewhere else? I can't conceive, I'm sorry to give you this answer, but I can't conceive of that happening because I think that anything that I feel quite strongly about is quite reasonable. Um, you know, I have never, I, I've never publicly said the list of things that's probably a bit more contentious because, you know, that, that will at some point attract criticism. But, um, you know, my shareholders are investing in our business and I am focused on our business and I don't sort of, go around wondering, you know, shouting about um, a collection of, of micro issues mm. that I don't mm. think affect mm. us all. Mm. I think if I had any shareholders <coughs> who thought that climate change wasn't, you know, a real issue or didn't think that, um, you know, that the health of our, the, you know, and our immune systems isn't an issue, I, I, know, I don't know what planet they're living on. So yeah. well, hopefully, hopefully... Tim Cook happens. comes up, to, up with them every day, yeah, let's face well, it. Well, do you know what? If I get to be like yeah. Tim Cook and there my market go. cap is Tim Cook's, then I am going to be just fine and happy. <laughs> so I will deal with that when I get there. Thank uh, you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, you know, there, there's...
Yeah, I always love coming and doing these events at CAS, and I, I look forward to the rest of uh, the series, and this is why I love doing them. Emma Sinclair, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.